from the Catholic Underground. Today on the show, Marching for Life, Making Your Own Textbooks, Tats for the Insolent Resistance Community, Getting Our Time Straight, Liturgical Time, Our Picks of the Week, and so much more. The Catholic Underground starts right now. your hand on the YouTube. It is time for the Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 284. If you can believe that, I can. I'm Father Chris Decker. If you are listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on with us. Joining me this week, as always, Father Ryan Humphreys, uh, rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana, joins us. Hello, Father. Hello, world. Also, Kathleen Lee, she is the Kind of tired campus minister at St. Michael the Archangel High School in Baton Rouge. She's our fully licensed faith ninja. Hiya. Hiya, for sure. <laughs> Jeff Blackwell is the technical director of the CU. He's the commandant of the Jeff Star One near Earth orbit satellite. He joins us, as he always does, here on Earth. Hey, Jeff. Playing air drums. So, ah, like somebody, <laughs> somebody's got to do it. Somebody does. <laughs> and of course, uh, Katie, the cat lady, for all the right reasons, Richard, is on the, uh, the video <laughs> feed. <laughs> Katie. Yeah. It's me- okay. I, Katie's uh, yelling at me from the uh, from the video production room, but but I got to say it's it's basically cat gifts. She sends animated cat gifts oh, to all of her priest friends, okay. mm-hmm. which I suppose is is cleaner than having a house full of cats. Yes, because yes. you can have lots mm-hmm. of images as long as you organize them. I think you're okay, right, Father? Yeah. Yeah. yeah organization <laughs> is the key to all happiness, joy, goodness, pleasure, and and really anything important. Spoken like a true obsessive compulsive. Thank you, Father. Yes. Yes, you're very happy. Welcome. There you go. So uh, so <laughs> my question, Father Ryan, is how did an OCD guy like you <laughs> enjoy the March for Life in all of the organization that takes place to put one of these things on? I had a temporary lobotomy, <laughs> and it worked out really well. It was Valium, uh, wasn't it, Father? It, no, no, it was more along the lines of just, you know, some Holy Spirit, if you're going to have to just turn off everything that is Ryan Humphreys for the next three or four days. Wow. And it worked out very well. You know, uh, we, we brought about 45 kids and, uh, and about seven adults. So we rented one big bus. We made the trip. Uh, we drove overnight and we did what we called a warrior trip. So we did not, uh, stay several days. We did not do a lot of sightseeing. We got there. We were there on the ground in DC for only about 30 hours. Oof. And then we were back in wow. the bus. My. So basically and, uh, the whole thing was a red eye trip. It was. It was all red. We went. Woo. We left Tuesday noon. And we got back Friday noon, and um, and wow. we had forty hours of driving on the bus in between there. But it was a warrior trip. We wanted to get our feet wet and kind of have an experience so that next year we can do a better job and start tweaking and getting to where we want to yeah. be. And it was remarkable. Even um, and of course, of course, we I I called roll constantly. But that was <laughs> that was as OCD as it got. The rest of it, we just kind of let it happen, and it was very cool. Very cool. And that's a so this is the the you're in the nascent stages of of developing a March for Life program, whereas over in the diocese of Baton Rouge. Uh, Kathleen, this is several years running now. Yeah, I think we're on year. I know it's my. It was my year seven. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was year eight. It was year eight for us. So mm-hmm. yeah, we it's pretty it was established by one Peter Fletcher, um, mm-hmm. who's now of the Diocese of Lafayette, um, mm-hmm. and has been been passed down to uh, to me and right. and and Deacon Brad Doyle and Ryan Halford. That's right. Wow. Uh, these are all Baton Rouge names and Lafayette names that, that you don't know. Yeah. Um, but, but now you do know them. And so welcome to the Catholic Underground. You'll hey. hear a lot of names that you don't recognize from Kathleen. But <laughs> so, so y'all, uh, y'all didn't just go on one bus. No, we, had, we took nine this year. Wow. Uh, nine whole oh. buses. We, we have gotten um, insanely up to 11 buses. Um, never again shall the two meet. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's a lot of buses. That's a lot. It's a lot. You know, but um, it's a fleet actually. Yeah, yeah. we had nine. We traveled in some, a couple of four bus groups, um, so it worked out pretty well. Except for we had one bus, our bus number, lucky number five, mm-hmm. that just, I mean, broke the. It broke down at Hansville. We had to leave it in Hansville. We left everybody on the bus mm. in Hansville. They were my bus buddy. I, I, at oh. one point, I had to go in and be like, so. Um, we're gonna go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and go. <laughs> yeah, uh, and they were they were about six hours behind us, um, that first day. But wow. So uh, the real question, Kathleen, mm-hmm. why, why do this? Why do this? You know, somebody asked me that question when we were in D.C. Um, you know, 
for our kids, I think we live in Louisiana. We are the most pro-life state. Mm-hmm. And so I always thought that, you know, this is what it was. This is what it was like, you know, that everybody everywhere was pro-life. So, um, but it's not that way. So to go to D.C. and see that there's a, a bigger movement, mm-hmm. uh, that there are people from all over the United States who believe, who think the same way we do. And, and not necessarily religious people, mm-hmm. but people, you know, who, who believe in the dignity of life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what's great about our trip is, is it's been built as, as a pilgrimage. And so from the moment we get on the bus to the moment you get off, we're not only talking about, you know, um, abortion, we're talking about euthanasia, yeah. death penalty, it, you name it, genocide. We're talking about these life issues. Mm-hmm. And what does society say about the dignity of life? Yep. And what does that mean? You know, especially, you know, it, it, in, in even little ways for our students, like how do you see people not, you know, not their dignity not being upheld in your yeah. school every day. That's right. It doesn't need to be an end of life issue, but it needs to be a dignity of life issue. I was listening to the radio uh, today and uh, there was an interview on um, NPR about, uh, about nuclear war and how it becomes acceptable. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things that the, the commentator was saying was that it becomes acceptable to eradicate another person when we find a way to dehumanize them. Yeah. If we make them into an object yeah. Then, uh, then we can Im- immediately, almost without even thinking, say that it is okay to destroy them. Yeah. And uh, and and I think that uh, that the the pro life movement in, in all of its forms, as you say, not just the unborn, but in in, in that wider scope, that march on Washington helps us uh, not only as Catholics but as a as a as a country, and I would even say as a world, to recognize that that there are humans who respect the rights of other humans, even if they are unborn, yeah. even if the world has cast them aside. Father Ryan, the numbers were big this year. Well, the last time I went, which has been about three years, it was 450,000 people. Yeah. And this year they said the av- the estimation, based upon the people who do this kind of estimation, was a little over 700,000. Mm. And, um, uh, and, of course, they changed the route this year, which made it so confusing yeah. uh, for people who had had their place. You know, people always going to the same place. And so I went to the place I had always gone before and found myself at the very beginning of the march, <laughs> which was <laughs> chaos because, I mean, that's where all the really – like intense groups. The group next to us, which was like 500 strong, had a dozen cheers. And before I knew it, one of my cheerleaders was in the middle of their group with the <laughs> with the, uh, with the bullhorn leading them. And I was, Sarah Kay, get out! Come here, come here. She had been drafted. <laughs> she drafted <laughs> herself. Oh, she she drafted herself. But uh, but the the sheer numbers were astounding. Like we all got to the the, the people at the front. We, we did the march, went up there. We were at the steps of the Capitol. We spent about 10, 15 minutes just kind of waiting, and then we went ahead and, and walked back to the bus. And we walked almost a mile because we didn't want to do the bus pass thing because that means sitting in line for a day. Yeah. Mm. Um, and we walked back to where we were going to meet our bus, and we the entire mile we walked, there were still people coming, still people coming. And um, it, was, it was insane how big, how long, how full the march was and, and how many different groups. But the thing that blew me away, Father, and Kathleen, you may have noticed it too, the lack of crazies. Yeah. I mean, there weren't your usual, usually on the march, we look over and you've got this one who's showing disgusting pictures and this yeah. one who's screaming hysterically. And, you know, and, and other than the one guy who had the big video screen showing the nasty pictures, mm. there was really no crazies there. Yeah. Um, and I don't know whether that was the Holy Spirit or whether it was police or what, but it, it was a better march. Uh, at least I found it was. Yeah, I, I, I agree. You know, and, and every year we we prep our kids that, you know, you may run into people who don't agree with you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we only had one run in like that. We, 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 um, we prayed outside of uh, Planned Parenthood mm-hmm. and this guy came up and it was, uh, that's one of my, like, to, I'm a words of affirmation person. So I don't do well when people yell at me mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was, I wanted to die. The things he was saying. Um, but it was such a moment. Like it's, it's one of my most uncomfortable moments of the, of the whole March when you go and you put yourself out there in front of Planned Parenthood yeah. and people, you just open yourself up to people who are, you know, who are going to, to yell and be nasty and, and, um, and disagree with you. And, um, and this guy was totally nasty. Yeah. I mean, he dropped all kinds of words and the, and the kids, it was beautiful because the kids just put their heads up. And they kept on praying and they mm-hmm. were like, this is what, cause we had told them like, it's all about love. It's all about, you know, mm-hmm. what are we here to do? What is our mission to pray, to love? And the kids without hesitation 
Yeah. You know, that that to me is the coolest thing that, the, that these kids experience, you know, mm-hmm. opposition or uncomfortableness or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and how they react to it without, you know, without a lot of, of prodding from us. And that's the thing, too. When the cause is just and the cause is true, you are able to be Christ mm-hmm. uh, at the Praetorium. You're able to be Christ standing near Pilate before all of the assembled people. Yeah. And you're able to stand there. And, and reflect yeah. he who is true. Yeah. And, and you're able to do it in a way that, that shows that you have dignity mm-hmm. and that you're standing for those who do not have the benefit of having their dignity recognized. And that's really what Jesus did uh, when, when he stood there and whenever Pilate said, behold the man. Um, he said so much in those words, even though he wasn't aware perhaps that he said it. And as Jesus stood there with the reed in his hand, you know, being mocked as a king, um, he looks out to the people and he says, Behold, you who will be saved. You know, he didn't say that in scriptures, but that's essentially what he's doing. Is I'm showing you your dignity by standing here. So how awesome! Yeah. What, what are, we had we had yeah. a really cool reflection because in front of this this particular Planned Parenthood, they put up like this this garden to kind of detract people from standing. And, and you know, we've checked with them with yeah. the city, and we can stand there and, and all this kind of stuff. So you had to kind of climb into this garden. And one of our students, you know, we're, we're reflecting on it. She said, you know, I wasn't excited about this. I wasn't happy about it. But as I was climbing through the garden, I realized that it was all rose bushes. And she huh. said, and it was, they were catching, all the thorns were catching on. Oh, my goodness. I mean, she said, this was my crown of thorns. Wow. wow. So this, she's wow. like, Jesus stood without, without hesitation, without a word, mm-hmm. and stood for what was right. And she said, this was my crown of thorns. And I was wow. like, what? And it's, it's like, Beautiful. it's those moments where it's, you know, I may be exhausted yeah. and I, it may be crazy. But those are the moments where I'm like, like it's not me it's not anybody who organized this trip right you know when we talked a lot this this week this past week about the quiet whisper mm-hmm. that god speaks to us yeah. and he did in so many ways you know in, in talking about that guy who was yelling you know just did jesus speak to them in a quiet whisper absolutely yeah you know? absolutely uh any anything father ryan that really struck you about this year well <clears throat> I, i've always gone to the vigil which is a big effort because it's a, it's a very difficult march. This year we had about 500 seminarians, about 500 priests, about 150 deacons. Uh, Always about, so awesome though. Yeah, Boy, it's, it's it. incredibly moving. And we had about 60 uh, bishops and six cardinals. And it was, uh, it was, it took 45 minutes to get everybody in the sanctuary. Of course, I got to walk next to Father Andrew Apostoli in procession, which was pretty cool. Neat. Uh, uh-huh. I'm busy reading his book right now and there's the man next to me. And I'm going, what? <laughs> um, so that was cool. But Cardinal O'Malley actually gave a really good sermon. The mass was long, of course, it always is, but yeah. he gave an incredibly good sermon, giving all kinds of data about mm-hmm. how we're winning, how success is taking place, mm. uh, you know, in, in the battle for hearts, but also in the battle for legislation. And it was an incredibly good experience. So I think uh, that vigil was really good. And of course, seeing my kids get back on the bus saying, we can do so much better here. We can do this. We can do that. We can wow. do the other. That was really what we wanted to see. I wanted kids coming back going, we're starting a group, right? When we get back, it's going to be yeah. called the St. Mary's Lifeguards. And we're going to blah, 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 blah. Nice. And I said, wow. this is cool. I said, this is exactly what I wanted to happen. Uh, and and so I, mean, I was excited because what we wanted was a year one that got people excited, that had some struggles and difficulties, and that made them feel like they wanted to take responsibility and authority. And that's exactly what happened. So thanks be to God. That's what yes, I wanted. Indeed. And, and that's really... That's that's really what all this is about. Uh, it's not just solidarity, but but it is so that uh, that we might witness to to those, especially to our young, that it's not just marching for the sake of marching, but it's marching so that hearts can change, yeah, yeah. so that the world can change in, in that sense. So very very cool. Uh, let us know maybe some of what your stories were. Backchat at CatholicUnderground dot com is the way to do that, and uh, and of course you can always uh, keep glued to the Catholic Underground because whenever there's a march for life. Well, somebody's going to be going, and we're going to be covering it. Uh, so uh, you're listening to The Catholic Underground. It is, in fact, The Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. We are online at catholicunderground.tv. I am Father Chris Decker, your humble host. Of course, that probably makes me a prideful host for saying that. Uh, <laughs> Father Ryan Humphreys joins us via Skype. Jeff Blackwell joins us via right there, and Kathleen Lee is uh, to my left. You're right. Yeah, I am. Our picks of the week are coming up, as they always are. But first, uh, we want to talk about Amazon, because we tend to talk about it quite a bit, but there's a new thing. 
there is a textbook creator um, for Kindle. And I am rather excited about this. I didn't know anything about this, Father, until I saw it in the show notes today. Uh, I know about Apple's iBooks author, so that you can uh, make books for the iBook store. And I've been, in fact, I was thinking about it the other day, how awesome it would be if, if Kindle were to come out with the same thing. Because there are, there are things that I would like to make into a book, if not for myself, but maybe for others. And lo and behold, I thought it into existence. <laughs> By sheer force of will. That's right. Oh my. I poured well, myself a cup of really hot tea, <laughs> and then I put the electrodes in the tea, and before you knew it, it appeared oof, out of thin air. Yeah. yeah. Well, you would do remember back in 2011, we had the same discussion on Catholic Underground about iBooks author and how it had the potential to change everything. Because before that, you had Lulu and you had CreateSpace, but there wasn't a good way to make a really good ebook that could be distributed well. Unfortunately, iBooks author has never really caught on. Um, You've had some people who've created some things. They've been interesting, but there's never been that breakthrough product. Uh, Now Amazon is stepping into the fray with a very, very similar product, but they're launching on Kindle, which is a much better platform because it's not just iOS. It's everything. And uh, and so it's exactly what you'd expect it to be. Uh, They're using a service called Kindle Direct Publishing, which allows you basically to put what you want into this. They really are focusing on textbooks and not mm. books in general, uh, but it looks to be a very, very simple way for a teacher or a college professor or anybody really to put together a long or a short textbook either for free or for profit um, and and to make it easily accessible to anybody who wants it. They can put it on any device that runs the Kindle app. So whether you're talking about your Kindle, your Kindle Fire, your iPad, your TV, or your TV that has Kindle built into it, anything like that is all there. Uh, and so it's a remarkably cool thing, and it looks like it's going to be very, very easy uh, and should be coming out. Uh, it's either out today or it'll be out tomorrow. Wow. I, I'm just thinking of all the possibilities. You know, we probably talked about this when we, we spoke of, uh, of the iBook author, but uh, I know, Father, the first thing I, I always think of when I think of, uh, of, of this realm is, uh, is our, our uh, theology professor, Monsignor Terry Teacat, may he rest in peace. Uh, who was trying to put together an e-textbook, and it was a big long HTML page. I got a B plus, and you yes. <laughs> wow. Father Ryan got a B plus for all the, for doing all the work instead for of an A minus. All the work yeah. for the entire semester. No, but I mean oh. that, that's yeah. We we put together this massive epic website when really the better solution there was a student could really our teacher could say make a textbook for your project. You know, yeah. put together an entire textbook, maybe not, you know, a thousand page job, but say, you know, what are you going to do? Put together a textbook for little kids. How is that different from one for fourth graders? And yet it's a good project and it's not hard to do. No, not at all. Uh, and that's the, these authoring software pieces of software generally make it very, very effortless. Uh, Ryan in the chat room says my idea for a textbook, how to make a Kindle textbook, which I think is golden. You could sell that for 99 cents and retire to Belize. Huh. Have you been to Belize? <laughs> No, nor have I been to Bahia, Donald. But uh, <laughs> now there's an obscure reference for you. But you're welcome. Uh, okay. So, so, uh, so yeah, th- this is a, a really neat thing, and um, and I, I actually I think I might have to download it. Um, so, is there a market for this? I mean, for for just everyday Jeff Catholic uh, to 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 use this Kindle Direct Publisher thing? I mean, I don't know. I- I mean, are we, is this like you can create you can create your own textbook, right? Yeah. Because uh-huh. I know that like you know working in a school, we've had issues with people, um, with with publishing companies, like it's almost like they jump the gun with their textbooks, and they especially put them if it's in, on e. Yeah, for like e reader, uh-huh. and they're they're horrible. I mean, it's you know it's like reading you can't highlight or anything. And it's like. You, you, the formatting is just awful. Yeah. Um. And so it's it's basically been hard. they just text dump. Yeah. It's like call it's it like e-book. a PDF, but you can't mm. interact with it or anything like that. Um. So I mean, I would be interested to see how people are, are reformatting or using you know mm. user friendly formatting, um, to do. I, and I think you know at least at least for the next ten years or so, I th- I think that you know, text as schools are getting tech savvy. Yeah. Um. They're gonna they're gonna be looking for easy to use textbooks. You know, from a reliable source. I don't. I still don't think we are at a point where um, we're ready to go off paper. Of, yeah, off of this. Well, to, to have a textbook is such a reliable source. Mm-hmm. You know, um, instead of going to a website or you know, you don't really know who. Um, so I, I think at least for the next 
10 years or something. Yeah, there, there's something about the, the printed page. Um, those monks knew what they were doing. Uh, there was something yeah. about the printed page to, to me uh, that that is that is stable. There's something stable about that. You don't have to worry about it breaking down, not having battery. It's, it's always yeah. there. Yeah. You know? yeah. um, in fact, one of the things that I found really interesting, because I happened to be looking for a textbook the other day, because I'm always interested, especially in the realm of television, um, what television textbooks are out there. Because for the longest time, Jeff, you might know this, uh, having done a little bit of broadcasting, but there are like mm-hmm. four standard television production textbooks that have been out forever. And I said, well, you know, maybe if there's a, an e version of this textbook, it'll be cheaper. Yeah. Nothing doing. Really? Yeah. The textbook, the television production textbook that's been updated is like two hundred and something bucks. Yeah. And yeah. the the Kindle app is like one hundred and ninety five bucks, or the Kindle book is one hundred and ninety five bucks, or you can rent it for, you know, fifty or sixty bucks. But it's amazing to me. I would rather pay two hundred and fifty bucks for a textbook that I could keep. Rather than a hundred and ninety five yeah. or two hundred bucks for um, for ones and zeros, yeah, I, but that, I, well, that's just me. Yeah. Well, the thing that raises my question is about textbooks generally. Is it used to be a real giant pain in the butt to print something that yes. looks like a textbook? So you had to go with Macmillan or or Harper Collins or whoever. This kind of market allows anybody to make a textbook. Yeah. And just like the the horror that was the early web design, just like the horror that was print, you know, desktop printing, if there is no if you know, if you say, Well, I've got a textbook here in some area like how to make a Kindle textbook, yeah. how do I know it's trustworthy? Right. Or is this just like a blogger who had an extra two hours and put it together? <clears throat> you know, my and I guess the big struggle is for now, there's still a certain amount of value in a textbook from a company, yeah. and and certain certain things are always going to need a textbook. You know, I mean, epidemiology or you know some mm-hmm. are combinatorics. <laughs> you know, you're always going to need a textbook for any it. of those things. <laughs> but but I, I think there are certain categories where you start saying, especially in the high school market, where you say more and more. I wonder whether textbooks are going to be a thing, um, and and you know, so it just makes you wonder: is the e e textbook really a thing any more than the print textbook because for some categories i think especially things like history and stuff it's almost better just to say buy this person's book read it yeah. it's not a textbook it's just a it's a non-fiction book right you know and i'm wondering more and more whether that combined with youtube combined with wikipedia are, are going to become kind of replacement for textbooks but i don't know it's an interesting thing i think the program is really good yeah i just make it makes me ask the bigger question and that's where and that's where ibook really had it neat because i've used ibook author and you can add in all of the video links and everything to make oh. a real interactive book but i i think you're onto something father with um who's telling the truth <laughs> in this textbook yeah. normally you know if you have a textbook that it's trustworthy generally well, I know when you've studied epidemiology extensively in the past, you know, or in combinatorics, you know. Oh, yeah. All of the, those two, things. The two most random topics I could <laughs> just came straight out of my brain. I love What it. do you do? <laughs> those books smell of leather and mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> those books there. So uh, about four years ago, <laughs> we discussed an idea uh, in development about a temporary tattoo that would read blood sugar so diabetics don't have to draw blood. You know, the little pinprick on, on your finger. Yeah. It seemed like a really cool idea, but now, oh yeah, it's a reality. Booyah. Yeah. It, yeah, I know. In I fact, uh, our, our video director, Katie, is uh, is already checking her pager, you know, so that she can... Because she's got that the, the, the little pump, you yeah. know? Um, am I supposed to say that? Okay, I can say that. Good. All right, because I did. It's on live TV. Anyway, uh, and so how awesome would it be to be able to to just just kind of scan the barcode or whatever? And Father, this is real now. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's still not exactly where we wanted it to be. The one we had discussed was a, was a tattoo that was printed on the arm, and then you would use your infrared, uh, use your camera phone, and it has an infrared channel on it. You'd take a, take a picture, and based upon the color. And the app would be able to determine with extreme accuracy within one or two points what your blood sugar was. Wow. This one is not that, but that required a needle. (laughs) That required a a tattoo. This is a temporary tattoo. It's a sticker that tells you if your blood sugar is spiking or not. They're working on one Hmm. that will be able to actually have a readout of a number, but that requires more power. And so, um, 
you know, Mr. Scotty is simply not available. And so they're working <laughs> on on doing it. And and as the the electrodes come along. But what they've got here is a, is a functional working prototype of wow. something that can do the work. Now it's just a function of tweaking it to make it do all the other stuff. Um, the, the current version they have only lasts for a day, but they can produce it only for a few pennies. And so you really can just put on a new one every day. And then, you know, if your blood sugar is up or down. And of course, as they say, in just a couple of, of years, they should have one that should be able to tell you right now my blood sugar is 115 i need to eat something or right now it's 260 i need to take a breath you know and stop father ryan i'm receiving a text message from the video production room (laughs) Uh, who is the maker of this do we know do you know who it is there's an article in the show notes that jeff is going to point us to later on that's right so uh so to the video producer who might be wondering about this (laughs) by a text message during a live show uh you have to check the show notes (laughs) No freebies well, I, here, folks. No, no. I think I think Jeff is the one who usually points us to the show notes. He does. Jeff, you yeah. ready? Go. Yeah. And if you're interested in this and want to find out more, how can we do that, Father? <laughs> Just go, go, Catholic, go to the show notes. Go to the show notes at catholicunderground.tv. <laughs> it's a silly what evening, is, folks. What oh he said. Uh, yeah, this is really good. It reminds me of, of the little strip that you could put on your head that would tell you your yes. temperature. Yeah. 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 Did you ever have that mm-hmm. as a kid, Kathleen? No, I didn't. Ha- I had that one time in Mexico. I woke up with 102 fever. And you woke up with that with thing on your head. With a sticker on my head. And I was like, what is going on? <laughs> <Que> es <eso? laughs> i never seen it before, but I thought it was phenomenal. Eso es el temperatura. That's what happens. You eat too many burritos, you end up with a sticker on your head that See, tells you your temperature. That's right. But no, I think this is great. I mean, I myself, I, I am, am also a diabetic. What? Like taking over the show. Wait a minute. Um, but I think it's great because I know so many people don't medicate themselves because it's a pain. Mm-hmm. Literally, it's a lot of work. it hurts. Like you, you callous your hands. You know, if you have to inject yourself with insulin, it's just it's not pleasant. And if you play the guitar. Yes. Mm. Hello. She does. I don't. Yes. I don't play the guitar. So like, and I myself I for a long time was like, forget this. I'm not poking myself six times a day. Like you can forget mm-hmm. it. Um, so I think this is great. I think it's. Um, it's it's going to be great for people who um, who can't afford a lot of diabetic, you know, all the diabetic stuff. You got to, you know, things yeah. and tabs and all kinds of doo doo. Like <laughs> if you can't afford it, those who just don't want to do it, especially the el- especially the elderly. Right. Um, this mm-hmm. I think this will be great. Uh, Tim the Sim, seminarian intern, soon to be clinical pastoral intern, wants to know, will this thing sync with the iWatch and the iPhone? Tim, you can bet it will. Hmm. Yeah. In fact, all, you'll probably be able to use near-field communication to touch it to your phone and probably you know, do something amazing. Well, there's actually a couple of apps for the iWatch that are, that are trying to simulate this kind of thing based upon the, the connectivity the watch has with the electrical signals oh, right. in the hand. Yeah. And so it, would, it wouldn't have the same accuracy, but you could imagine that in just in a year or two, sort of the same way it took a while for the step pedometers to to get good right that they'd be able to do the same sort of thing based on electrochemistry with your with your body to be able to predict where your blood sugar is you just using the, the eye watch itself wow because yeah. it's got electrodes in the back oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah it does for a mild electrical shock <laughs> don't take that watch off buy what i told you to buy that's right exactly <laughs> when you when you walk by the the things in the the keurig 3.0 It'll it'll you know buzz your arm to remind you it's time for coffee. No no, drink your coffee now. Wow. Yeah. You buy from us. We paid an extra dollar to shock you every time you walk by the store. If you don't buy, it's true. You have thirty seconds to buy, or we shock you. It's only a matter of time, George Orwell. It's coming true. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, I think it's time for me to tell you who we are again because <laughs> you probably have no idea. <laughs> What have I stumbled on? You're saying to yourself, <laughs> it's the Catholic Underground. Why? I'm Father Chris Decker, and uh, I'm your host. Father Ryan Humphreys also joins us. He's uh, via Skype. He's in Natchitoches, Louisiana. You know that place up there in North Louisiana. Kathleen Lee joins me, um, as she always does. Jeff Blackwell also joins us. And Katie Richard, you don't see her, but she's there. Yeah. She's, she's like... She's like the angel just kind of hovering over your shoulder, except she's not an angel because angels are their own species and she is human. I was going to say she's like the flu. What? You feel the, what? It was, I mean, you feel the not symptoms. Not in a mean way. <laughs> you feel the symptoms, but you don't ever see the disease. It's like the Blair Witch, but in a nice way. It's all right. You're going to you. get a tap to the head. In a good or way. Shock to in the a arm, good Kathleen. way. <laughs> 
<laughs> so all of you, uh, all of Kathleen's relatives who are going to watch this on Catholic Life Television, <laughs> call her. See what's yeah. up, because obviously something's going to yeah. anyway, <laughs> All right. We, we always talk about time on, on this show, not just because we have a time frame to keep, but because we are Catholics and we are concerned about the, the glorification of God through time. And uh, one of the ways that we do that is the liturgical time. And there's always a question that comes out uh, after we, we cross the threshold of Eastertide, of Christmastide, into ordinary time. Mm. And ordinary time, I've heard it described in so many different ways. In fact, in my own parishes, they tend to think of ordinary time as the time in which nothing can happen. You know, <laughs> Father, we can't do anything uh. like this, this, and this. Uh, but there's actually a reason behind this, this word, um, even though it's a bit of a misnomer. Yeah, and it's it's really only English that does this because when we say ordinary in English, we mean boring or regular or you know ordinary. But in fact, what we're talking about is ordinal in terms of counting or numbered time. So a better way to translate it in English would be numbered time or ordinal time, or as I say in my parish, Sundays throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Per um, annum in Latin, right? Per annum, right? Yeah, and so. In the revised calendar, which changed around 1970 or so, um, the, a season that, of pre-Lent that we called Septuagesima mm-hmm. was kind of summarily thrown out. And there's a whole big discussion about whether that should have been our case or not. But if you don't have pre-Lent and you count Christ the King as a solemnity separate from the rest of ordinary time or time throughout the year, there are 33 Sundays, counting right. the baptism of the Lord as the first Sunday. And so that number for obvious reasons, is good and symbolic. 33 Sundays, 33 years in the life of Christ. Um, And so it it has some value. And in fact, there is a certain tradition of doing it this way in certain points in history. Uh, What a lot of us don't know is that there is another practice that makes a lot of sense as well. Uh, And it's still used frequently for those people who are celebrating the traditional Latin Mass, those people who are keeping the old calendar. Um, And that practice has a time after Epiphany and a time after Pentecost, a maximum of seven Sundays after Epiphany, and I think 29 after Pentecost, Twenty no, 24 after Pentecost. And the logic is that there are six Sundays maximum between Epiphany and pre-Lent, Septuagesima. And you took those Sundays to meditate upon the mysteries of Christmas and Epiphany, mm-hmm. because that season is short. And so it gives you time to think about in a less intense way, what those feasts are about, the coming of Christ, the coming of Christ at the end of time. And so time after Epiphany would have been meditating on the person of Christ, his entry into the world, so on and so forth. And then in a parallel way, the time after Pentecost is for meditating on the Trinity and the mission that the Holy Spirit gives us. And of course, that makes sense yeah. to do that throughout the entire year. And so there was no such thing as a separate season that didn't have any specific mission, that was an ordinary time or just kind of a throwaway season that simply didn't exist before. Um, And of course, this happens in English because the word in the homonym, homonym, is difficult to deal with. And so some people, including myself, have tried to inject some meaning into the season by saying, well, ordinary time is when we become saints and blah, blah, blah. But it always feels a little rudderless. It feels like you're just killing time for half the year. Um, until you get to the good stuff, you know, when the non-green Sundays come up. <laughs> and so that's kind of the background. There are two very different ways of thinking about it. Um, the wisdom of the old is shown. The wisdom of the new is being shown. And, of course, we in the in English have a little difficult time because the, the words are homonyms, and that's confusing. But it's just good to point out where we stand because the priest never has a time to say this in a sermon. Right. People would be balancing their checkbooks or simply passing out in the pews by this, uh, <laughs> this moment in the sermon. So it's just good to say. And so I just wanted to... <laughs> to throw that out there and say, here's where we stand with ordinary versus the way we used to deal with non-festival time. And it, it is a really interesting thing because I've, I've often wondered, um, as I preach the homilies in ordinary time, that there are some very distinct connections, of course, with the, the seasons that precede them. Like right now, in this little portion of the beginning of ordinary time, uh, following the Epiphany, we're talking about the call of, of Simon Peter, the call of James and John, the, the call of Jonah the prophet, and how there really is kind of a, a kind of a little encapsulation of things to meditate upon. Uh, and, and I often wonder if those were connected in some way to the seasons that came before them. And I, I'm sure the answer is yes. Um, but, but yeah, I, I often get that. Actually, I have to be honest with you. I, I, and you may be the same way, Father. I tend to look forward to ordinary time 
because I know it's a day that I can I can stand down from yellow alert. You know, I can go. Yeah. Okay, I can I can just um, if I need to I can say the Gloria. <laughs> I can you know I can move kind of uh, matter of factly through the liturgy because sometimes those those non green times yeah. uh, as as they should be are times of kind of heightened awareness. But really, would you say, Father, for the Catholic, there is no real time where we shouldn't be um, of, at heightened awareness. Like Paul said this weekend, time is running out. Yeah. Well, I mean, every Sunday should be a day of festival. Yeah. You know, and so we shouldn't be able to look and say this Sunday doesn't matter. It's only the ninth Sunday in ordinary time. Um and I think most of us realize that. I mean, none of us say that Wednesday and Sunday are the same day. We realize that Sunday is a bigger day than a random other day of the week. Right. But it's just it's it's having a proper way to contextualize where we are. And it's not it's you know what it's kind of become is like I said the throwaway Sundays or the mm-hmm. rudderless Sundays where you're like oh the father's just going to talk about whatever he feels like because you know it's nothing else to talk about. It's ordinary time. And then of course the revised lectionary has made that difficult too yeah. because you end up with with five or six Sundays where you have the exact same metaphor. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. This, uh, the kingdom of God is like exactly what we talked about last <laughs> week and the week before that and the week before that. And, and the priest is the preacher goes, for the love of God, <laughs> can I have something other than a metaphor about gardening? You know what I mean? You know, and it's, it, it's, the, in the old in the old calendar, you didn't have that kind of consecutive week after week after week repetition, oh, really? and so it, it becomes difficult when you got five. Actually, it's, at one point it's seven consecutive weeks of gardening metaphors about the kingdom of God, and it's enough to make a priest throw himself off a bridge. Just so you know, it's, <laughs> no, don't it's do that. <laughs> very very frustrating, and it's it's annoying for the people because the priest is basically saying, "Hi, gang, we're going to talk about exactly the same thing we talked about last week, and it ain't going to stop there." <laughs> Well, Father, I can say this. If you use that hyperbole in your ordinary time homilies, then I think uh, your parishioners would be pretty much glued to the pulpit. So, After a fashion. My people hear my preaching a lot. I think they're not going to be glued to anything. (laughs) They've heard it all. Yeah, I actually, one of the things that I do appreciate is when the Bread of Life discourse goes kind of verse by verse for a whole bunch of weeks. That is nice. And and so you really can dive into the Eucharistic mystery, Mm. um, especially when it gets to John 6 verse 66. Look it up. Um, all right. Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's move on a bit, shall we, uh, to, uh, to Pope Francis and Cardinal Burke. In fact, uh, the way that it's often portrayed is that they're kind of head-to-head like those two helmets crashing at the Super Bowl. But are they really? Uh, computer says no, Father. <laughs> it does say no. Uh, it, it seems that the, uh, the drama mongers have multiplied since Pope Francis arrived on the scene. And anyone who says anything that doesn't 100% line up with what the Pope says is somehow considered at odds with him. Um, in fact, Pope Francis, like Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict before him, spoke recently about the necessary role that the genius of women, I love that phrase, yeah. the genius of women has to play in the church. Well, several days later, Cardinal Raymond Burke spoke about the detrimental, quote, feminization of the liturgies of all the sacraments. And the two are speaking about entirely different things. Mm-hmm. But of course, in the papers, you know, it's like these two hate each other and they're going to, they're going to steal each other's toenails if they get a chance. Um, <laughs> but uh, what Pope Francis do. is talking about is the institutional church's governing structures. Yeah. Uh, the institutional church's pastoral outreach and especially the methodology, the way in which we go about doing these things, all of which are directed toward us. They're directed toward our salvation. They're directed toward you and me and, and the church. And because they're directed toward us, yeah. we need a blend, a complementarity of masculine and feminine efforts because this is who we are as human beings, just as there is a blend of spiritual and physical efforts or visible and invisible efforts. Right. And so it's everybody agrees, Cardinal Burke and everybody, that there needs to be a masculine and a feminine aspect to the way the church organizes herself, governs herself, teaches, pastors, ministers, etc. Absolutely. In fact, uh, I know, Kathleen, we talk about that quite a bit, that, that there is very much of an importance of recognizing that the church is, the bride of Christ is male and female, it's us. Yeah. And and that, of course, has to be reflected in some way. Absolutely. Yeah. So what makes different what Cardinal Burke is talking about is he is talking specifically about the worship of the church. 
the sacraments, the liturgies, which are directed, if you remember from your reading, mm -hmm. toward God mm -hmm. and not toward us. We receive some benefit from experiencing those things, but the liturgy of the church is directed toward God first. And so that worship is structured, directed, and modeled by Jesus, and it's placed in the hands of the male clergy, not because males are better than females, because this is how Jesus has established it. And throughout history, that God-centric work has always ended up being very, fairly masculine, and the church has thrived in the midst of that. Now, you have to remember that's balanced by all the devotional life of the church, which is very, very feminine, because that devotional life is meant to be a combination of offering our prayer to God, but also edifying us. And so you have this kind of interesting complementarity where the worship of the, of the church directed toward God is very masculine, and the worship of, our, of, of the, the, the devotion of the church and the devotion of the laity, which is oriented toward God and toward us, yeah. is feminine. And so there's the complementarity that the two have. Well, in the last 50 years, what's happened, and we've talked about this before, is that everything's been squashed into one. Yeah. The mass and the devotions and the novenas and the prayers and everything has all got to be squished together. And so what you end up with is this very confusing mishmash mm -hmm. where you don't have a chance for this to be about God and this to be about me and this moment to be about teaching and that moment to be about sanctification. And they all each have their proper place. You just have this big blob of stuff, um, you know, and it's sort of like saying, well, OK, I'm going to eat dinner just by putting it all in the blender together. And I'm talking about my steak, my potato, my pie, my drink, all of it in the big blender. And it doesn't make it better. Yeah. Um, but that's what's happened is that instead of having these these separate services, we've blended it together. And what what Cardinal Burke is saying is that that's been detrimental yeah. because we've lost touch with the aspect of directly toward God. We have not lost all the devotional stuff. That's what's taken over. But in doing so, we've lost touch with the masculine principle of we should turn and orient and direct ourselves toward God. And so what he's saying is not in any way at odds with Pope mm -hmm. Francis or any of the other theologians. What he's saying is that everything should have its place and everything should be in its place. And what we've lost in the last 50 years is the proper complementarity where the masculine and the feminine both work in tandem. What we've had is the feminine has taken over, the masculine has been lost, and now we have no complementarity. And, and that's what he's basically saying. And so at the end of the day, he's not really trying to punch anybody in the gut. He's just saying it in a way that offends people because people nowadays are really good at being offended. Yeah. And, and so I guess uh, as we as we listen to the train pass. Yes, yes. We appreciate the trains. They're beautiful. <laughs> there, there, there are two questions that, that, uh, that come to mind. OK, um, shouldn't the mass be both God centric and us centric? Is there. In a very real sense, no. The mass should be God centric. And while we can receive a benefit from being present for it, it really is about God. It's sort of like, you know, let's say, Father, I'm going to attend the Catholic Awards and you're going to win the award, you know, of some sort, and I'm going to applaud for you and I'm going to derive some benefit from seeing you there. Yeah. I'm going to be edified by you receiving the award. But at the end of the day, this is your night. Yeah. And, and while I may be blessed by it, it's your night. And it should not, I shouldn't insert myself into it to say, but I want some of this attention. Yeah. It's your night. And it's the same thing with the Mass. The Mass should be oriented toward God, and whatever I receive secondarily from that is great. But there are separate things that the Lord has given us, like yeah. the Liturgy of the Hours, right. like the Rosary, that are meant to be us-centric. Right. And then, of course, uh, deriving from that community life, the parish picnic and things oh, like that. Absolutely, yes. Th those are meant to flow from the liturgy in such a way where we, we have experienced, and this is, this is Catholic theology, Acts of the Apostles 101, where, where we have experienced a, a worship of God together as a unit, and then we, we come down from, from the liturgy into parish life, into uh, the devotional life and into the parish picnic and all those things. Yeah, and that's the Christian community where we encourage one another, we exhort one another, where all the spiritual and corporal works of mercy take place, right. where the virtues grow. All of those things are very us-centric in the very, very best sense of the word. And so when they flow naturally from an authentic worship of God, it all makes sense. But when you have to have the big handshaking and the birthday celebration during Mass, right. it all kind of falls to pieces. And so and so here's the other—the the second question is— 
is is there a relationship between this and kind of the numbers we've seen um, in in the past thirty to fifty years? And this is a, a point of some contention, but it becomes very hard to say that it's not that mm-hmm. there's not a connection because church attendance prior to the liturgical adjustments uh, following the Second Vatican Council was somewhere around 90, 95%, depending on what part of the country you looked at. Yeah. Now, the most recent data I've seen is that average church attendance in the United States is 15% of My self-identifying goodness. Catholics. So you go from 90% to 15%. Wow. Clearly, other things have happened. You know, the 60s have happened, the sexual revolution has right, happened. Right, there's cultural stuff. Other stuff has happened, but, but a number, uh, an adjustment that significant, uh, it becomes nigh on impossible to say that there is not some correlation, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because if people don't feel like attending mass is important, then we say, well, what's changed? And if the mass has changed, then we have to say, we don't, what we ought not to say is let's just put it back and see how that works. But what we ought to do is say something's not right. Right. That critical examination is, is important. You know? Yeah, well, it's it's sort of like if Tim Grimes is about to go to uh, CPE, the the <laughs> most obnoxious way to describe that is courageous personal examination. Oh, you've got to look inside. It's and true. of course, that's that's what the church <laughs> is doing yeah. now, as religious orders age and as more and more of these kind of things become obvious. We have to say, what do we need to do? How do we respond? This is the signs of the times, the Second Vatican Council called us to. So, what do we do? Right. And, and, and those are always the questions because the, the church, as it has been said for so many years, uh, for thousands really, the church is always in need of renewal, always, constantly. And so I think perhaps as we cross the threshold into 2015, 15 years since the, the beginning of the third millennium, as John Paul II uh, rightly called it, these kinds of questions are important rather than just kind of moving, moving forward without, uh, without any sort of examination um, because there, there is a lot to be said uh, about uh, about young people being drawn to the liturgy when it when it glorifies God. You know, young people are certainly drawn to the liturgy. Um, some might might say now in a more traditional style. Um, I, I don't. I, you know, I'm sure that there are masses where there is contemporary music and things like that 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 does glorify God, that does worship God. Um, and Kathleen, you as a, a person who um, have have done music ministry for a while could probably speak to that a little bit, that yeah. there is contemporary music uh, in Mass, but it's all about the orientation yeah. that yeah. draws people in. That's always so difficult. Like when you talk about having a youth, you know, a quote-unquote youth Mass, and um, I, I did a lot of, of that for a couple years, and, and there was a lot of growth and understanding about what the liturgy is and why do we call it, you know, why do we call it a youth Mass? Why don't we just call it the Mass, man? Like, and not <laughs> call it, like, why does it have to be pigeonholed? But there's a lot, you know, when you talk about liturgical music, um, you know, are we having, you know, solos in mass yeah. with contemporary music, you know, and what is that, what does that detract from the mass yeah. a lot, you know, because then it does become about one person right? and then it becomes, well, if this person is good, well, then I have a good experience in the mass. If this person is bad yeah. and I have a bad experience in the mass, it is based off a human being who is, who is flawed. Story of my homiletic life, yeah. lady. <laughs> <laughs> who's going to be good, who is going to be bad sometimes. And it's like. If I base off of this one person, if it's us centric, yeah, well then it's bound to fail, yeah, you know. But if I base it off of God, if I base my experience off of of what, and I it should becomes be throwaway. If it's us centric, yes, I can say, well, maybe I'm just not going to go to the show this week. Yeah, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. So, well, very good. Um, let us know what you think. Backchat at catholicunderground dot com. You always have thoughts. Won't you tell us them? Backchat <laughs> at catholicunderground dot com. But now, Jeff, we're going to go to that part of the show that we often like to call. The CU Pick of the Week. All righty. Okay. Uh, pick of the Week. Let's, uh, let's round table it. Uh, Jeff's been feeling a little uh, under the weather. And so your Pick of the Week is directly related to your condition, such as it is. I know we could say cruddy on the radio. Oh, like yeah, that. yeah. I don't know. This thing, this thing came on like overnight mm-hmm. three weeks ago, and I'm still, uh, well, I'm catching a healing. How's that? Um, <laughs> from yeah. those? From, from your Pick of the Week? No, no, no. Well, these help a lot. I was gonna, uh, Bert's Bees is my uh, pick of the week. Um, and they're called throat drops. They're not really cough drops, uh, but uh, they're honey flavored. They actually contain about 35% honey. And um, they really have um, helped soothe the throat and helped me out. Uh, got a little touch of eucalyptus oil oh, in there yeah. and some menthol, but uh, mostly honey. I mean, I just really. I, I, 
They're recommended by four out of five Jeff Blackwells who use cough drops. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we can do this. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> recommended by four out of five dentists who choose. So to use uh, anyway, I just and, and they're not very expensive too, uh, and that's the the nice thing about them. And uh, you know, just carry a couple in the pocket and. Um, that reminds me. There's a there's a documentary on Netflix about Burt's Bees hmm. that I've been meaning yeah. to watch. Yes. That's a complete non sequitur. You're watching the Catholic Underground. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, ro- rolling on. So not simple. That was it. Uh, not medicine. It's just something to really help the old throat out. That said, hey, you know, sometimes the best are. picks of the week are the ones you can get at the drugstore. You know, just something simple. You know, I love a good. Uh, my pick of the week should have been a, a fountain, a disposable fountain pen that I found at the drugstore for the first time in 50 years. I found a disposable fountain wow. pen at the drugstore. I'm impressed. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen, what's your pick of the week? Well, well, you know, <laughs> so as glad we, you asked. Yeah, back to me. Okay, so um, this week, as we were on the march, we went to a, uh, of course, Matt Marr, um, beautiful Catholic musician, does a concert, and this the, the night before the march. Yeah. And so uh, this year we went, and there was a band that was playing called Rend Collective, and I was mm. like, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> wide open mouth the whole time. I was like. Oh, and there was no sound coming out of your mouth. No, as it was just open. I it was gaping. Phenomenal. Okay, Ren Collective is a band um, that's out of Ireland, and it's a group of it's a group of five. It's four guys and a girl. Um, they're young adults, and what happened? They're not Catholic, but that's okay. Um, they Yet. they they uh, they're yeah. Irish. Well, let me tell you, some of the stuff they were saying about heaven, I was like, I think you're Catholic, dude. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, is it? It's just, um, you know, these, these five young adults, and they started in Northern Ireland. Um, as a young adult ministry, um, and they just have phenomenal lyrics, and they—I mean—they play like these just weird instruments. I mean, they got this crank. I mean, every and it's one of those bands where they play every instrument. So like they—they—they wow. they, they just scoot around and play. I mean, there's there's so like they're the, virtuosi. Yes, yeah. and they're and they're so mm. energetic and so prayerful. Like he just you know, and, and all of his lyrics. It's very Irish because all of his lyrics are very. Um, I felt like there was a like a movement that I was joining. I was like, "Yes, this oh, is awesome!" Right. Yeah. You know, um, but it's great lyrics, beautiful, beautiful lyrics. Um, and and the 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 lead singer, um, was just so, so cool. I mean, just th- what he was saying about, um, about worship, hmm. and about he was you know because he was like, "This is not even you know, this is not even half of what you're gonna experience you know after this." So he's like, "So put all you you have into it right now." And I was like, "What?" It was. Hmm. It's beautiful, and their music is super fun. So they have a, um, a couple of albums I downloaded. Um, the Art of Celebration is, I think, their newest one, but the one that I like the best is, um, I think it's called Campfire. Did you hear that, Father Ryan? The name of their album is Ars Celebrandi. <laughs> well, I, I heard it. I'm looking at their website right mm. now. I and think you would they like dress, them. They dress like Macklemore. Yes. Mm. And according to my fancy computer, uh, there is a Spotify um, yes. channel there. But, but Campfire is is the one, is, is there, their... Not their latest, but their second latest. Um, and it's those last two I downloaded, I've been listening to, and they're it's just phenomenal. Very Great neat. Stuff. I'm always on the lookout for for a new group, uh, Kathleen. You'd like them a lot, I think. Yeah, I probably would. Are they quasi emo? Just a little? A little bit, just, but yeah, they're too cool that. to be emo, though. Like they, oh, they pull I see. it off way. Do, I mean, like it's natural cool. Do they come off as perhaps like Irish hipster then? Yeah. <laughs> there, there yeah. yeah. You'd like them a lot. I would like to drink a Guinness with them. Yes, you would. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. So, uh, Father Ryan, your pick of the week. My pick of the week is somewhat unusual in that it is really not uh, for kids. It's not for family. It's a book by Stephen King oh my. called The Stand. <laughs> now, I uh, there are a number of really, really good Catholic apocalypse books. The best of all was Father Elijah by Michael O'Brien. The Stand... While it has some one one incredibly disturbing graphic you know sexual scene and has a lot of nasty language is a remarkably Catholic book um, that that does a shockingly good job of describing the a, a very realistic way of which uh, in which God works. Um, it's a remarkably theologically sound book. And uh, I, I just finished reading the extended version and had never realized just how theologically sound it is. Now, it has some problems. It's got some errors and so on and so forth. But for those people who are kind of looking for something that is a little darker, a little heavier, and uh, are you know a little anxious about the end of the world, um, 
or even not. It, it's a remarkably, <laughs> not. It, it's 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 a remarkably good book, and uh, it does it does open your eyes to the fragility of life. And I, for one, am very very happy to have read it. Uh, as I said, it does have some uh, a few moments of of graphic sexuality and has some pretty nasty language uh, throughout. You know, it's very just natural language, um, but. But I recommend it strongly for those people who are adults and who are kind of interested in a, a bit more of a gritty or heavier read to give them a kind of an appreciation of what we have. It's it's a remarkable book. And uh, that in combination with Father Elijah, in combination with Voyage to Alpha Centauri, uh, make for really, really hopeful reading, um, even though they are fairly dark, uh, dark topics. So again, this is a mature audiences only pick of the week. Yes, it is a mature audience's only pick of the week, but it's it's a remarkably good pick of the week, and it's very inexpensive on the Amazon. Yeah, my my uh, my inner inner censor is going off, so I I won't be reading it. I'm scared already just looking at the name Stephen King on the rundown. <laughs> I I can't do it. Anyway, I'll remove it for you right there. <laughs> my pick of the week is uh, is actually an Instagram channel or an Instagram user. Uh, I, I woke up uh, the other morning uh, having a pretty. It was a, it was a difficult day before. And it was looking to be a difficult morning, and uh, and the Instagram user, the Oodles of Doodles, is a, is a young woman who um, who every day in her journal writes a scripture verse or some other um, kind of uh, aphorism or whatnot in her journal, and she does it in that that you know Kathleen that scripty girly mm-hmm. style that's really kind of neat. Yeah, huh? that doesn't look like a St. Joseph's Academy yeah. prom T-shirt. Okay, which is right. my number one rule of graphic design. <laughs> All right, I got gotcha. uh, Don't make it look like that. Anyway, so so I read this and it was and it was from Ecclesiastes. It was a beautiful, beautiful passage, and it was exactly, of course, what the Holy Spirit wanted me to read that morning. And the rest of the day was great because I was rooted in the scriptures. Um, so she is my pick of the week. She and her artwork, and um, and that's that's my pick. Uh, Jeff, we always thank those who support us. Always. Yes, we do. Uh, those, uh, I guess, benefactors the, yes. that uh, take care of us here by donating at catholicunderground.tv. Also, audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground uh, is a uh, underwriter. I was trying to think of what I'm supposed to say there. That's right. That's it. They, uh, they are. Okay. They are, in fact, under router. Audible uh, trial. under routers. <laughs> audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. Yes, indeed. And uh, if you're if you're watching us on CatholicUnderground.tv, you notice that we've got uh, kind of a new look to CatholicUnderground.tv, the webpage. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Um, you can uh, take a look at our brand new blog as well. You can get there. Uh, uh, just go to CatholicUnderground.tv and be tempted with some blog. For all of the show notes that accompany this episode and everything on the podcast, if you want to find out more about our apostolate, go to CatholicUnderground.com. That's the way to do it. We're also on social media. You can find out more about that. Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org. He's at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan. It's been my distinct pleasure. Indeed. Indeed it has, and it's been ours to receive you. Jeff Blackwell is the tech director for the CU. He's the ruling despot at the uh, Blackwell Communications Group. He's at Jeff Blackwell is on Twitter. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure, Father. Kathleen Lee is their faith in ninja. And she is also on the Twitters at Kathleen Y-A-B-R. Thank you, Kathleen. Anytime. And uh, Katie Richard is, uh, well, she's there. And uh, she she also dresses up at kids' birthday parties, but as a giant cat. You know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. Follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Join us on the interwebs for more from the Catholic Underground. As always, thanks for tuning in. Hang out with us. For Catholic Underground, we're Faith Gone Digital. We will see you next time. Catholic Underground.